Welcome to Arrowhead RSVP, your invitation to volunteer. Sponsored by the uh, Arrowhead RSVP and the Northland Volunteer Center, the volunteer programs at AEOA. Hi, I'm volunteer coordinator Denise Ramford. You know, sometimes people think volunteering, it's no big deal. Well, here's something to think about and visualize. Imagine if one day all the volunteers simply didn't show up. What would our towns, our parks, our libraries look like? What basic needs would go unmet? What opportunities to grow, learn, and thrive as a society would be lost? And the big question this time of year? If the volunteers stayed home, who would prepare the Ludafisk dinners? The truth is, you likely cross paths with a volunteer at least once a day. You may not have direct contact with them, but you'll be affected by what a volunteer has done. The work that volunteers do is essential, and oftentimes an unseen part of many nonprofit organizations. Whether reading to a child, providing respite to caregivers, preserving our local heritage, bringing groceries to the homebound or promoting tourism. The social and economic benefits of be being delivered to the community by volunteers is enormous. One organization that relies on care and support of volunteers is Essentia Health St. Mary's Hospice. And Didi Thiesenwitz has joined me today to share with us um, what hospice is about and the volunteer opportunities that are available there. I am. Yes. Thank you for having me. Yes. So can you give us a, um, an idea of what hospice is? Well, hospice is a philosophy of care, which involves an interdisciplinary team to take care of someone at the end of life. And we look at that person in a holistic manner. So not only are the physical symptoms managed and looked mm -hmm. at, but also their spiritual life. Their uh, relationships with their families and um, the needs that they might have uh, as patient and caregiver to um, provide get some support and that's where our volunteers come in and I like what you said about what would happen if all the volunteers didn't show up and in hospice if all the volunteers didn't show up there would be no more hospice really and the reason for that is we are the only primarily federally funded program, most of our funds come from Medicare, okay. which is required to have volunteers. And my volunteer hours must equal at least 5% of the paid staff hours really? in order for us to be Medicare certified and um, be able to operate as a, as a hospice program. So volunteers really are a, an important part of yes, your they program. Are. Yes, they are very important. Very much. Uh, um, so you have many different, how are you, how do you get in contact with um, a, a patient? Um, we get a referral. Okay. Referrals can come from anyone. It could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could be their doctor, it could be um, us knowing about them and talking to them about hospice and they can refer themselves to hospice. Um, if it's going to be a friend that is going to do the referral, they really should talk to the patient and the family first before they make that referral. That people might get upset if they, yes. <laughs> yes. If they were referred to hospice and had no idea they were being referred. But um, as I said, anybody can make the referral. And okay. once the referral is done or is made, we have certain things, certain criteria that we have to follow in order for that person to be um, recognized as a, a hospice appropriate. Okay. So we would contact not only their primary care doctor, but our medical director, and they would review all of the notes from the hospital and the medical record. And um, then there would have to be a diagnosis that that person is uh, admitted to hospice service okay. under. And um, 
All of that takes some time. We also look at insurance and Medicare kind of sets the standard for hospice and hospice okay. care. Most private insurances do have a hospice benefit. Some private insurances have a hospice benefit, but it's very limited. We just ran across one where they only covered hospice for 11 days. Wow. Yeah. We were surprised yes. because we'd never seen it before. Um, and Medicaid also provides hosp the hospice benefit. Okay. However, we do not turn anyone away for lack of ability to pay. Nice. We will look for a payer source, but if we can't find one, then we um, will just take care of that person regardless. Your main objective is the care of the Exactly, patient. and focus on the patient and mm -hmm. the family. Nice. And that's one thing about hospice too, is that the patient drives the care. Okay. So the patient says, I'll take this medicine, but I won't take that medicine. Or the patient says, I want to go to this hospital if I have to be in the hospital, or I don't want any hospital okay. uh, hospitalizations. So it's all driven from the patient and the primary caregiver and the rest of the families. And what vision. they want to do or what mm -hmm. they're comfortable with um, having, exactly. having done. And one of our goals is to meet with the family within uh, two weeks after they're admitted to hospice service just to make sure everybody is aware of what is happening okay and uh, where we kind of see this patient at where we can make some suggestions and where the family can come together and all get on the same page okay because as we all know families have some challenging dynamics yes. sometimes yes and um, we'd like to make sure that all parties concerned understand what's happening with the hospice patient and that ultimately it is the hospice patient's decision that we focus on okay and um, that is uh, we do that until or if they uh, are unable to make decisions for themselves and then it would be the primary caregiver who would okay. do that every patient has to have a primary caregiver um, Sometimes it's a, a legal guardian, sometimes it's a daughter, sometimes it's a spouse. Um, but we always need somebody, and it doesn't mean that they do the, all of the hands-on caregiving. It just means that they can make choices for that person. It's a second person to go yep. to. And they can make choices for that person when they're unable to make choices okay. for themselves. Nice. Um, and as far as volunteers fitting into all of this, you talked about the staff that you have um, and the process that you go through. At what point do volunteers get involved? Well, once the, the patient is admitted to the hospice service and everybody who is required to see them has seen them, then I will either call the patient or I'll see in the notes that they want a, a volunteer. Okay. And I'll do an assessment and we'll see what it is they're looking for as far as volunteer help. Now our home care volunteers, uh, which is one of the volunteers that we're really kind of searching for right now, um, they just offer practical support. Okay. Um, for example, um, the, vol the volunteer could go in, sit with the hospice patient while the primary caregiver goes out and runs errands or, you know, maybe it's the wife and she has a hair appointment and right. she really likes to do that once a week so the volunteer can go sit with that, that patient okay. and uh, just offer some socialization, visit with them, or if the patient doesn't feel like talking, the patient can go lay down or whatever and the volunteer will just be there yeah. as a as a support to it's, that person it's if very, they need something. It's very um, nice to be supportive of the family and give them a little respite from, mm -hmm. from all their exactly. duties of care. Um, some of the practical things they can do is they could, you know, if there's a sink full of dirty dishes, they could do that. If it's somebody who primarily lives alone and it's a son or daughter who's the primary caregiver, they can help that person do some light dusting, run the vacuum. Okay. We don't ask them to do floors or windows. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had one family, it was a young mother, there were four children and a husband, and um, in order for them to keep up on laundry, that's what the volunteer did. She oh my went goodness. every Thursday and Friday and did laundry for that family, and that's all she did. I mean, she provided you know, moral support yes. as well, but yes. having that laundry done for the week mm -hmm. was such a big help to that mom. I'm sure. Because then she could concentrate on being mom while she was still able to. Right. And hubby can concentrate on being hubby. Yep. So um, 
They can fix a light meal. They can, um, if they have a special talent, like right now we have a lady who speaks German, and very often she's not, she's speaking German to the people who all speak English. <laughs> so if I had a volunteer who spoke German, okay, I would assign that volunteer to go and visit this sure. lady. And, and, you know, because life review in German for us, we don't understand what she's reviewing. Right, but right. If somebody could understand what she's saying, and her daughter can, but okay. um, her daughter needs a break once in a while. Oh, of so. course. So it's, it's, you never know where those hidden talents exactly. are going to come with your volunteers. There's a lot of people who, um, who like to do scrapbooking, and if I have volunteers who like to do that as well, they can go, they can help. Oh, do that scrapbooking. Yes. There's a lot of people who like to do handwork. They can help. We had one volunteer go in and and try to help finish a quilt top okay. for one of our patients. The, sadly, the patient died before that was done, but it was just that socialization yes. and talking to her and working on that quilt. And, and a little purpose yes. to... Yeah. That's so, nice. Some people like music. If they, you know, have any kind of musical talent, they could go and and uh, play for the patient and the family. Okay. Some people, and we also have um, volunteers who are veterans who go and uh, visit one on one with veteran patients. They certainly have a unique relationship mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. where you can can Absolutely. match them up. And all of our veterans are recognized for their service, for their okay. time in the military. And our, some of our veterans go and do a nice um, structured uh, presentation of a certificate and a flag and a pin. And nice. most of them and their families are very appreciative of that. I bet they are. I bet they are. It's a good time of uh, reminiscence for them. And we have a, a program through the National, the, the We Honor Veterans program is through the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization and the okay. Department of Veterans Affairs. And there are certain levels that we can attain through that program. And we just recently attained our level two. Okay. And we're now moving on to, uh, to go to level three. And they're also looking for community partners such as um, funeral homes and places like that that, that that will do be a part of that We Honor Veterans program and, and spread the services around so that we're okay. aware of what is out there for the veteran. And what, what's available to the family and mm -hmm. how, how it can all mm -hmm. play a part in what's going on. Yeah, we can, with the help of our county service officers, we can get veterans enrolled pretty quickly so they can receive that hospice benefit through uh, the VA. Mm -hmm. And mainly that um, goes to, um, if there is a reason why that veteran can't stay home, there's a contracted nursing home here in, or over in Eveleth, and that veteran can go there and receive hospice services, plus the services that the, okay. that the, uh, the nursing home gives them, and their room and board would be paid by the VA. Wow. So, that's nice. Um, then they're not that huge, far and away. That's a, right. And that's and a huge benefit for a lot of people, you right. know, because it's getting a little expensive. Yeah. Yes, it is. So, I, I know I always talk to volunteers who are hesitant about trying something new, mm -hmm. or they have a lot of questions about what exactly that involves. And um, do you find that with your volunteers as well? Mm -hmm. I, I would imagine, especially with with this subject, people can get kind of uneasy. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happens when we do a training, and we have a training scheduled in January, um, the 18th and 19th, I think I'm going to do it in two days. Um, we go over all of the opportunities for volunteering. Okay. And those people who would be uncomfortable volunteering in the home with the patient, has they have other alternative ways of volunteering for hospice and that but that is one of the biggest uh, times that volunteers are uncomfortable is when they think it's all going into the home oh. all spending time with the patient right right and a lot of people will say well how can you do that job it's so sad and I said you know it is sad because ultimately we know what the outcome is going to be however we concentrate on their living we don't concentrate on their dying. On the time that they have. Exactly. And we concentrate on making sure their quality of life is the best it can be and um, that they're enjoying time with their family and you know, just living out the rest right. of their, their lives. So um, besides home care, 
Can I just move on here sure. to the next one? Sure. We have uh, staff support volunteers. Okay. And those are volunteers who can come into the office. They can help with mailings. They can answer phones. And one of the big things that we're looking for right now are people who have uh, computer skills, or at least enough so they could transcribe notes into the oh. electronic medical record. Sure. All the volunteers who do home care have to fill out a note on their visit. Okay. And all of those visit notes have to be transcribed into the medical record. Um, we don't have the ability to scan them in right now. We don't have the ability to, to cut and paste. We don't okay. have any of that ability. <laughs> so they, what they do is they sit in front of the computer and I show them the, the routine on okay. what has to be done, what has to be checked. And then they just transcribe the note from the volunteer note Okay. And that's what allows me to keep track of my time okay. and make sure that I'm always living up to that 5%. Oh, and it, it's very important too um, for everyone who is involved because you mentioned the team. So if, if everybody involved has access to all the same information, mm -hmm. that's very important. And, and in a timely manner. Yeah, and it, it's always interesting. Um, you know that someone may want to be supportive of this program and this is a wonderful example of you know it's it's um, all the options are different mm -hmm. and and what you would be doing mm -hmm. and but you would still be um, supporting the mm -hmm. program there in staff support and all of those hours do count because it it is not direct patient care but it indirectly affects how the patient is cared for. Certainly. So um, all of those staff support volunteers are, we love them. We treat them well. <laughs> <laughs> they hate to leave us. Oh. <laughs> um, and they, you know, they, it, that's a very important role, especially this transcription role. If we right. can find somebody who's whose uh, technical ability at least goes up to that point. We, we're also looking for some data input maybe with some, some um, spreadsheets and those kinds of things. Okay. But if we can get the transcription taken care of, we're, <laughs> we're rocking. Helps a lot. Yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. There are um, uh, the next opportunity for volunteering is the 11th hour volunteer okay and I have had people sh show an interest and what that volunteer does is they provide support for the patient and family in those last days hours minutes okay normally or usually what happens I won't say normally but usually what happens is I'll get a call from a facility and the patient is transitioning meaning they're um, actively dying. Mm -hmm. And the volunteer will go and sit for two, maybe three hours with that patient so that that person isn't alone. And in facilities, a lot of times, families don't live close, so it takes them a while to get there. And um, I try to um, schedule my 11th hour volunteers so they're not spending a large amount of time doing 11th hour because okay. this can be very taxing can be very emotionally draining certainly knowing that you're sitting with someone who is you know breathing their last breaths right and so they're trained there's an extra training for 11th hour volunteers and they're kind of on call however um, if they're not available, they're not available. Okay. And there's, we don't get upset or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. We don't want volunteers to feel guilty if they have to say no. Okay. Which a lot of us, I think, can identify with. Yes. When <laughs> yes. <laughs> when you have to say no to something that you think is important, but you just can't do it. Right. Right. So um, they, they can be a liaison between what's happening with the patient and the family and the staff, the medical part of the team, mm -hmm. or the spiritual part, or the bereavement part. Um, they can make phone calls, they can answer the door, they can organize food if they're in the, if they're oh. in the home. I've not had too many people in the home itself, Okay, but mostly in facilities. And I have one volunteer, she, uh, she always just hates to leave them, so she does end up staying the night very <laughs> often with them. If I can, you know, but I, I usually, try to um, have people scheduled between two and three hours with okay. the person. Usually, and usually starting in the evening around supper time because in facilities, that's a real tough time for staff to sure. be as attentive yep. as they would like 
because there's a lot because there's dinner time and then after dinner time they're getting people ready for bed and so those are the times we try to Mm -hmm. fill in when staff in facilities are really really busy and you know can't really go and sit with that person and our goal is that nobody dies alone Mm -hmm. however there are you know people will sometimes make the make their decision known that they they don't care if, <laughs> if they go when nobody's there or they'll purposely wait i think sometimes and the volunteer or the family steps out of the room and yes they'll go just just it depends quickly. on the individual yeah. Yeah. And, and how absolutely. they want to absolutely to handle it so moving on to the next, and I want to assure everybody if they call the office, we're glad to talk to them, we're glad to answer any questions for them, and they can talk to me as the bereavement coordinator, or I mean the volunteer coordinator, sorry. <laughs> 48 <laughs> patients has made my brain into Swiss cheese. A little cheese. too much. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was looking at bereavement volunteers. This is another area where we're really needing uh, a, a lot of volunteer help. Okay. And bereavement volunteers um, are assigned families after the death of the patient and they follow that family for the next year, making oh. phone calls, sending cards, just checking in with them to make sure all is well, they don't need any extra support. You know that grief journey can be um, can be a long one, can okay. be a hard one, and sometimes people will go along and they'll think, you know, boy, I'm really doing good, and then something will happen and it will all come tumbling in on them. Or they, you know, it's peaks and valleys. They'll be sure. doing well here, right. then they're down in a valley, then they're up on a peak. And so that's where the bereavement volunteer comes into play okay. to make sure that when somebody is experiencing one of those valleys, there's somebody there for them to be able to say, you know, I'd really like a call from your bereavement coordinator. Okay. I'd really like a call from your spiritual care person. Somebody um, to reach I'd out really, to. Yeah, them I'd and... really just like, I'd like to come into the office and talk to your bereavement coordinator. So those are the, so we can assess throughout that year how they're doing. Okay. And I will say that most people, you know, we've all experienced loss. We've all developed coping skills. Um, and most people do cope very well. And our bereavement volunteers are never given uh, a patient or a family's, a patient's family who might need um, extra support in terms of their grief journey. Okay. They're given those people that we judge to cope very well. Okay. And um, they always have the team backing them up to the volunteer so that if there are things that are, come up and it's over the volunteer's head, they that can call, they can talk to our bereavement coordinator, they can talk to me, okay. and we can figure out a plan to make sure the family's getting supported and the volunteer isn't feeling uncomfortable about, right. Right. about calling and talking to them. And that's one of the things that I always try to assure volunteers is that there is always support there for exactly. you. You know, you never just put out on your own right. to handle something that you that's why you and I have with. our jobs yes we're the support <laughs> <laughs> as volunteer coordinators um, it, uh, the bereavement volunteers also have uh, opportunities for clerical work as as well okay. in the office they um, have developed a couple of different positions where volunteers can come to the office, they can go directly to the bereavement coordinator, and she will have letters that she's mailing out, she'll have assignments that need to be made. We also need um, rose deliverers. Oh! Hospice presents the family with what we call it a bereavement rose okay. within three weeks after the death of their loved one. Oh. And our team, not all of the teams work like ours do, but our team um, has volunteers who deliver those bereavement roses. And that just means, you know, picking up the rose, which is already paid for, um, calling the family, making an appointment to come out and de- deliver the rose, and spending 15 or 20 minutes with them just kind of checking in, making sure things are going well, seeing if they need extra support. You know, that's all about that support after the death. Right, right. That can be very important for families. Yes, it can. Because they've, you know, they've taken care of this person and been in such intense relationship, and now they have to develop a new normal. Right. And so we're there to help support them as they do that through their grief journey. So Rose Deliverers and Bereavement Follow-Up Volunteers are two of that 
particular job opportunity that they're that we're looking for okay um, and um, the very last thing that I have to offer as a an opportunity for volunteering would be um, facilitating support groups oh we have an opportunity to have our facilitators trained down in Duluth by okay. the grief support services and um, there is a opportunity for their tuition to be paid and um, they can travel or they can stay the night down there that's not something that we are able to reimburse them for but at least the tu tuition is reimbursed okay and it's a very I've done that particular training uh, grief support services does a great job um, it usually lasts two days and it's the kind of intense two days okay but if you're interested in doing support groups it really gives you a very nice um, uh, foundation for being able to handle most things that come up in a support okay. group um, difficult situations where maybe one person is um, monopolizing conversation oh where okay. you could you know because very often in groups we have one person who kind of yes keeps jumping in there so to speak and um, it gives you ideas on kind of how to handle that okay and um, it gives you ideas on how to make rules for your for your support group because that's something that you know there should be boundaries and okay. things it, it's just a very nice overview and foundation of how to conduct a support group and how yeah. to be the facilitator and how to stay out of trouble <laughs> well and at any time when you take on something like that it is good to have um, a little bit of training a little bit of background and um, and and not just to send you out there on your yep. own yep and, and there's always a staff person that you, you know could be sometimes it's Kathy who goes and does the support groups with them um, that's something I do for the grief support services is co-facilitate a, a support group okay. down in Duluth so um, I've been asked before as a staff member for hospice to go and sit in on those support groups and and help with that kind of stuff so once again you know we don't leave you out there right kind of by yourself there's always support there's always people you can go to for advice kind of debrief if there's you know if a, a night happens to be particularly emotional okay and um, so home care volunteers 11th hour volunteers <laughs> bereavement follow-up volunteers and and we can find the office spot support for yep. anybody. Yes, yes, we can. And um, the bereavement follow-up volunteers who do the f telephoning can do that from their home. Okay. They don't have to come into the office to do that. And sometimes that makes a difference too. If you have a volunteer who's working full time, mm -hmm. and they would like to do something, but they know they can't, you know, come in and spend hours in the office. Right. They would be assigned their their patients. The information is sent to them. They have a calendar that's all ready for them to okay. know when they need to make these phone calls. They're, you know, it's very well organized, and there's a special training for that as well, over and above the volunteer training. Wow. And maybe I should talk a little bit about that as well. All of our volunteers must do the vo hospice volunteer training. Okay. And that usually is between 16 and 20 hours. Okay. And it covers every aspect of hospice care. So we talk about the medical part of it. And we talk about what volunteers can do to help relieve, you know, some of the symptom management. Let's say you're with a patient and they're short of breath you can if they don't if they're not wearing your oxygen uh, their oxygen you can encourage them to do that you can uh, suggest that a fan is running in the room just to keep the air circulating okay. you can get a cool cloth and kind of you know pat their face a little bit you can just sit and hold a hand and kind of um, get real soft with them and then calm calmly kind right. of just talk to them so it takes their mind off of their shortness of breath okay um, um, so the, the volunteer training has um, ha has ways of teaching you mm -hmm. all of these yes, things yes. that you might encounter or going through them and and the staff who take care of that aspect of the of the taking care of the patient come and do the presentations okay. so the volunteers have an opportunity to ask questions of that that professional staff okay and know that that professional staff is there for them 
after they are done with the training and they've decided how they'd like to volunteer sure. and what they're going to do. So, so there's always, and the, the whole program is about support. Mm -hmm. And so of mm -hmm. course you're going to support your volunteers. And team, <laughs> yes, and team support. Okay. You know, because sometimes I think volunteers, when they're feeling that uncomfortableness about going to hospice to volunteer, mm -hmm. think, how am I ever going to do this? But they're not doing it alone. Right. They're doing it as a team member. Okay. Yeah. And our volunteers are also um, able to come to our um, to our interdisciplinary team meetings. We do that every two weeks where we review every patient. Okay. And if they want to see how that works, they can come and be a part of that. Um, they can call and report to the on-call nurse if there's something going on in the home that they think that on-call nurse should be aware of. Okay. Um, there's just all all different kinds of ways that they're supported and right. need not feel alone out there. Good. Well, I think that um, this is a wonderful opportunity for people. Um, you think of anything else you want to to add? Well, as I was getting ready to come here, I was thinking um, we are passing our 14th year. Oh. In December, that nice. this that this hospice team has been in existence. And when we first started, we hovered around eight or ten <laughs> patients. Today, we are looking at between 45 and 50. So um, the need for volunteers is, is, a, is a strong one, yeah. and I hope everybody will consider at least investigating. And if they come and take the, the, the uh, training and they don't feel that this is a place yes. for them, that's okay. I, I try and, and stress that with volunteers that um, try it. If it's a good fit, that is absolutely wonderful. If it's not a good fit, we can find something else. Mm -hmm. Because we certainly don't want a volunteer to be uncomfortable oh. or unhappy. They, they exactly. won't be doing anybody a good service. Exactly. And so, um, yeah, it, it's good to, to feel comfortable in what you're doing. And, and what a to have grown that much as a program, mm -hmm. you know, shows how much there is a need for it. And, um, and how many, and I think most of our, most of our referrals come from word of mouth, people who have experienced, had the hospice experience and had a with good our experience. team and had a good experience, um, are very often telling their friends if they know somebody who has a, a loved one who needs that support at the end of life. Yeah. And when the doctors say there's nothing more we can do for you, hospice is what we can do for you. Nice. Well, great. Well, thank you for being here today. My and, pleasure. And sharing all of this information. Um, there are so many meaningful ways that you can contribute to the community. Um, you could provide leadership and education with the Girl Scouts. You could help distribute food through the senior nutrition programs, Meals on Wheels, and Groceries to Go. You could assist the Virginia or the Aurora Public Library. You could serve as a court ambassador with the 6th District Court in Virginia. Uh, several of the area care facilities would appreciate assistance whenever they are going out on an outing or have parties or special events. The Lyric Center in the Alcott Greenhouse would be grateful if you're willing to share your time as a greeter. And it's also coming up on tax season and we are looking for AARP tax aid volunteers. So if you enjoy working with numbers and take pride in doing a good job, and if you can provide four hours a week between uh, February and April, this might be something that um, that would work well for you. And there will be a training in January for those volunteers as well. And and again, the, the list and, and diversity of what's available and what you can do, um, we can find something that'll fit. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, the social and the economic benefits delivered to the community through volunteers is enormous. So if you'd like to be a part of that contribution, give me a call. I'd love to help you make a volunteer connection. Thanks for watching.